Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Madam Chair, for your generous uh, seating of time and, and place. Uh, Ms. Baker, uh, let's start with you. Uh, demand for access to Spectrum is increasing day by day, as we've discussed. Uh, it's a shared asset among federal and non-federal users, and obviously we need to increase research. Uh, the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, ITS, as we've talked about a little bit, uh, is in Boulder, uh, is the premier research lab for, uh, for spectrum issues, uh, currently supporting the DOD and the FAA to prevent spectrum interference on radar uh, systems. So how would modernizing the use of funds from the Spectrum Relocation Fund support the research mission of ITS to inform future spectrum policy decisions? Thank you for the question. It's a really good one. Um, the Spectrum Relocation Fund has done an awful lot um, and really um, changed the way that we manage spectrum. Uh, there is a school of thought that says that they can't use the funds for future um, spectrum management, like to, to look to see when they might want to reallocate, that it's when the, action, uh, the auction is already pretty much scheduled and CBO knows that they're going to get the money back, that that's when they can use the Spectrum Relocation Fund. So it might be worth this committee's time to look at the Spectrum Relocation Fund and see if there are improvements that agencies could actually um, look for future um, relocation when it's not an actual relocation that's going to take place. Uh, and those funds might be able to be used for that. Interestingly, I also understand that um, while any agency can use spectrum relocation funds, um, NTIA, which actually manages spectrum, cannot. So um, one way or another, I think, Senator, you know I'm a big fan of the ITS labs and that they are a great new, neutral arbiter of um, spectrum decisions and that increased funding for them would be a good idea for this uh, as a priority. All right, what might we, we might almost cost an uh, alignment of self-interest. Um, Dr. Bazalan, in your testimony, you discussed the value of unlicensed spectrum uh, and the need to consider uh, those use cases uh, when creating spectrum policy. Um, what are some of the examples of how unlicensed spectrum is used to benefit society? Um, and how should the value of unlicensed spectrum be factored into reallocation decisions? And, don't let your superior education force you to overshine these people. He went to the same college I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, um, the, wireless, the wireless uses um, create value, but not in a way that creates a demand to pay uh, for spectrum at auction. But the social value, the consumer, and it's worth saying that for the, even for the commercial uses where we see the large auction values, the hundreds of billions of dollars spent, it's really 10, 20 times that is the value of that spectrum that goes to consumers. So when you think about the value of the spectrum to consumers, significant amounts from licensed, but also significant amounts from unlicensed. So measuring those, it's not just the Wi-Fi devices sold, but it's the value of connectivity in your home. It's the value of um, the Internet of Things devices that are going to end up um, uh, being on these frequencies. And measuring that value to consumers is what policymakers should be weighing when they consider whether uh, more spectrum needs to go for unlicensed versus licensed uses. And how much? And how much, it, well, they need to go to both, so it is a question of how much. Right, I got it. I agree completely. Uh, Dr. Van Ah, um, and I, when you earlier mentioned that you didn't think the GAO would opine on that, I think that's the first time, I'm relatively new here, but the first time I've ever heard the GAO not opining on anything. <laughs> There's never been a, a limitation to their opinion. Uh, anyway, the GAO reviews, reviews of interagency spectrum management uh, and uh, clearly identified a lack of collaboration processes, as, as you've described and we've discussed already. Uh, disagreement over technical assumptions, the interpretations of some of the data behind those assumptions, uh, especially from vested interests, this is, uh, again, natural, uh, has been a, uh, at the root of these disputes. Does the GAO have recommendations to help resolve the interagency uh, disputes such as um, using, in some form, independent third-party analysis? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator Hickenlooper. We don't have recommendations specific to using a, a third party, but that's certainly, when we make recommendations to the agencies around 
trying to come together to have you know, common um, understanding of what sort of technical studies should happen, we leave it to them to sort of under, to, to determine exactly the best way to do that. Should they decide that a third party would be a, a useful tool in certain circumstances in terms of an arbiter, I think we would be supportive of that. Um, you know, in the new MOU that uh, between FCC and NTIA, they do talk about a renewed uh, focus on sharing technical information. They each would sit on advisory committees of the other. Um, and so I think that also kind of goes a long way to, what, to getting at what you're talking about. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And you guys have discussed in so many facets of interoperable, inter, interagency collaboration that I think that's the point we'll all take away from this, one of many points. Anyway, I yield back to the chair. Thank you.